All right, another podcast from the Michigan Institute of Athletics in Brighton, Michigan. It's going to be an awesome podcast today. Me and the guests were having probably about 20 minutes of conversation before the episode even started, and I'm stoked for this one. So right before we get into it, I want to shout out VetLife. VetLife is a 501c3 nonprofit company. It's a company of veterans for veterans. Every veteran faces difficulties when they transition from active duty back to civilian life, and VetLife is there to ease that transition. If you want to reach out to VetLife, you can do so through Instagram or Facebook, or check out their website at vetlifetoday.org. So without further ado, I want to introduce Bill Krieger. Um, Bill, I don't know if you've seen any of my podcasts, but we're going to start this one the same way. I don't want to know about the man that you are today yet. I want to know about what built you into that man. So I want to, I want you to take the story all the way back. What were you like as a young man? You know, where were you born and raised? What were the things that were influential to you? Or what did you think this life had in store for you? And then we'll slowly start to build through your experiences. Man, I hope you have some time. <laughs> let's go. Let's get it. All right. So I was born in 1965 in Lansing, Michigan. So I'm, I'm born and bred a Michigan boy. I left for a little while, but we'll talk about that later down the road. Uh, you know, I uh, grew up in the 70s when it was cool for people to get divorced. The no, whole no-fault divorce thing had kind of come around, and so uh, my mom thought that would be a cool thing to do. So, Really quick, uh, I've never had a guest ever say that to me. What led to something like that? Because yeah, I know like the 50s especially, like the foundation of the family, the American dream, the white picket fence um, – having a father and mother in the home, what that does for children, like the, what do they call that? The nuclear family. That is such a crucial component of a healthy society. I have never had someone say to me in the seventies, it was cool to get a divorce. W what led to that? Or what do you remember from that era? Obviously you were young, but what was the movement that pushed that? Well, I can only kind of speak from my experience now, right, kind of looking back. As a kid, I didn't really understand that, you know, dad isn't going to live with you anymore. But it really, I think, evolved from the time when in order to get a divorce, you had to prove that somebody had done something wrong, right? Somebody had to have cheated. Someone had to have, you know, been a bad partner. Someone had to have beaten somebody up. And in what if they didn't? Like you could not file for a divorce? Oh, you could file for a divorce. It would be very difficult to get one. Because it wasn't a no-fault deal, right? There had to be fault in order to get a divorce. There was none of this, um, what do they say now, uh, irreconcilable differences. That didn't exist. And then something happened. I think it's just part of the whole you know, evolution from the 60s into the 70s. And uh, everything had happened that uh, suddenly you could get a divorce just because you didn't want to be married to this person anymore. And that's really where we landed. And I saw you know, not only my parents but a lot of my friends' parents – you know, splitting up and getting divorces and things like that. You know, I don't think not to the extent that you see it even today, uh, because it was fairly new, it was fairly novel, but it was just like this whole domino effect uh, that happened. And so that happened with my parents when I was very young. I think I was 12 or 13 uh, when my parents split up. And, uh, you know, I went from having both parents in the house and uh, having this stability to, uh, you know, my dad moved out. He really wasn't there very much. Uh, he worked, you know, seven days a week, 12 hours a day at Oldsmobile. He was a factory guy, a blue collar. Uh, I think that's where I got my work ethic is from him because I saw him work all the time. And my mom worked uh, in order to support the family. And so my brother, my younger brother, my older sister, myself were latchkey kids. And we pretty much raised ourselves uh, we were feral children, if that's even a word, right? We kind of just did our own thing. We went to school, we came home, and we, um, you know, we ate whatever food was in the house, and we hung out with whoever we hung out with, and it led to a lot of really uh, bad things happening to all three of us as kids. Um, but I just, th that's what really sticks in my mind. That really shaped a lot of who I am is watching this thing happen with my parents and then seeing how it impacted three kids. And when you're a kid, you you have no control over anything. It's all, the adults have all the control. Um, so it was very chaotic. We moved around a lot. Uh, even though my dad worked his butt off, the guy never had two nickels to rub together. Like, I didn't get it. My whole life, even now, I'm like, what happened? Like, how do you work this hard and have nothing? And uh, so that was kind of my childhood. We, you know, it was just constant moving around, constant change, 
uh, constant chaos. Let's talk about for a second, you had structure and a loving family at the early developmental years, it sounds like. like. Like you had a mom and dad in the home, you had structure. Are you the oldest of the siblings? I'm the middle kid. You're the middle kid. So yeah. you, you've got an older sibling, you got a younger sibling. You have the good, you have the American dream life to some degree. I mean, every, varying shades of it. I don't know what quality of man your father was or mother was, but you had like the basic mold of, of you know, the American family for a good start. Then all of a sudden that comes into your life. The divorce happens, your structure gets ripped out from underneath you was there resentment from you on that part like do you remember at that young age having any resentment for either your parents because a lot of the times I feel like when you expose kids to difficult situations like that their emotions tend to be flared and it tends to aim at somebody and that causes a lot of effects down the road or were you kind of just going with all right mom and dad are kind of going to split up and after the structure was then pulled out of your life Looking back with the lens that you have now, do you know any noticeable differences in the way that it might have shaped you and your your siblings? Just talk a little bit about like you had lightly hinted at the idea that like some bad things came to the picture then because of this tearing apart of the family. Can you share anything deeper about what you went through in that experience? Yes. So to, to kind of go back to your original question, and I'll get to that one as well, um, I don't know that I had resentment towards my parents. Um, I just felt sad all the time. Like if I heard a certain song on the radio that I used to listen to with my dad in the car, I would, I would just start crying. And um, I felt tired all the time, like tired to the point where I felt like I was dying. I don't, I don't know if, how to really describe that. So for me, it wasn't really resentment. It was more like I was developing some mental illness, to be honest with you. I think I had depression and all these other things, um, and that was tough enough. Uh, but I don't, you know, I don't know what TMI is on this show. But I know anything, man. I, like because the truth in situations like this might save someone that's going through a dark moment. Like when you just said, I felt tired all the time, and I felt to me that is depression. Depression is like not even being able to drag yourself up out of bed. You feel empty to a level that you couldn't even have described before. Like no physical exertion could have ever made you feel the way that that felt. And I know exactly what that feels like. And like that is depression. Maybe it wasn't labeled as much back then or maybe you didn't recognize it like this is deep. But that is a perfect description of what some people experience. Yeah. So that that was going on. And um we were left alone a lot. And so we would hang out with the neighbors or we would, I mean, we would find friends and, um, you know, I'm not going to speak for my siblings. This is their story to tell as well. But for my story, you know, I fell in with a group of older people who, uh, who took advantage of me. Uh, and for a long time up until probably my teens, because of that experience, I thought there was something wrong with me. For a long time, I thought I was gay. For a long time, I thought I had done something wrong, that this was my fault. Because it went on for a long period of time. This wasn't just like a one-time thing and it happened. This went on for a long time. And I think that's where I have some resentment to my parents. Because as a parent myself, I know that if you're there, most of the time, those things aren't going to happen. If you're interested in what your kid did today... If you're sitting down at the table talking about what happened in school, and if you're making sure that your children are home uh, and in bed when they're supposed to be and you're taking care of them, that kind of thing is less likely to happen. I'm not saying it won't ever happen, but it's less likely to happen. And then, uh, because there wasn't this support, uh, I just internalized it, right? I just lived with it for a long, long time. That makes perfect sense. I mean, when you have kids that are going through either traumatic events or pain or their structures ripped away from them, they become vulnerable. They could become vulnerable because all of a sudden you like, you're experiencing these emotional pains. You're not your normal self. You're almost looking for acceptance and like good feeling wherever you can find it. And you become almost prey to people that can victimize other people. And like 
you see it all the time. You see kids that end up in situations where you're looking at the way that they're living or the things they're going through and you're trying to trace back like how the hell did this kid end up in this situation? And it's not usually just a precipice. It's not just instantly he was a good, happy kid, great structure in his life. Now he's in the world of drugs or all these other darknesses that can come up in life. It's a process by which either being naive when you're young, you don't know, man. You don't know how dark the world is. And it's like one of the things I try to make a point with my fiance son is, and it's hard to have these conversations, is to kind of try to warn him about some of the darknesses out in the world. And a lot of the times the trap doors that are right in front of you seem glittery and shiny and like something that you might want to be a part of. And it could be the worst pit you could find yourself in. And it's like a tight knit family, a nuclear family that's sitting around the dinner table and talking to one another and loving each other and being intricately involved in your lives and your thought process will spot this shit. You'll be able to say, I see something's going on here. Something's happening. What's going on? Bill, you got to tell me who are you hanging out with today? Who have you been around? What are they, what are you guys doing? And that can, you know, that's how you keep, that's how you keep the wolves at bay. I don't really know how else to say it is you keep, stay on your guard, right? So life was able to take you into some places that weren't good for you and didn't serve you in a state where you're already battling with depression and the split up your family. This probably drove you way lower. Did, where did that lead you to? And then what was the thing? Like, was there a final moment? A lot of times people hit a certain depth where you almost like have the realization like this is not right, something's wrong, it needs to change. And then generally it's like an upward trajectory even though you might go back down. Did you have one of those moments, Bill? I did. That moment happened a lot later in my life as a result of a lot of other things that went on. You know, I don't want to um Let's not fast forward that. Yeah, I don't, I don't I yeah, I definitely so don't want to do let's that. Let's continue to organically build. So you're I can I understand where you're at at like the middle school stage of your life leading up to high school. Going into high school, what do you like as a young man? What do you think life has in store for you? Your parents are split up, but you got to start to be trying to figure out what am I going to do? Who am I going to be? You know, walk me through the high school stage of the life. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, junior high is interesting because uh, as a kid, I was always the short fat kid. You know, I was probably five seven, weighed about two fifty, two seventy. I was a big kid, and um, why do you think that is? Do you think that was some of the traumas and the difficulties and the lack of guidance and you know everything? Like a lot of the times, traumatic people that are experiencing pain and suffering, they tend to not take care of their body and all kind of other things because your world's a, a wreck. Oh, do you yeah. think that was a contributing factor? I, I think it was. I you know I, again. Uh, as I was growing up, I ended up moving between my, my dad and my mom's house. So I, when I was living with my dad, um, you know, uh, personal hygiene wasn't a big deal. And eating properly wasn't a big deal. And so I was this huge fat kid. And I remember that um, you had two choices when you're the fat kid in junior high, right? You can either get your ass beat every day or you can be funny. And so I learned how to be funny. I learned how to tell jokes. I learned how to make people laugh because when people are laughing at you, they're less likely to pound on you, right? So that was my defense mechanism. So I went through uh, most of grade school and all of junior high, the fat kid, and it was torturous. But here's the thing is that between ninth and 10th grade, because in the Lansing school district, uh, at the time, 10th grade was high school. Junior high was seventh through ninth. It's different now. Uh, but anyway, between ninth and 10th grade, um, I grew. I grew to be about 6'1", and I dropped almost 100 pounds. It's like 179 pounds, 6'1". When I walked into high school, the people I grew up with didn't know me, right? I did not look like I looked before. Uh, and so that was a game changer going into high school. You almost got to start writing a new chapter. You got to say, hey, the kid that you knew before, we're closing that chapter. This is Bill Krieger now. I'm bigger. I'm getting myself together. And a lot of times, like I said, you go through darkness. I was talking a, lot, a little bit before the podcast. You go through darkness. You come out a stronger warrior than the man that went into the darkness. So now you're showing back off and you're kind of like, hey. Like at the very minimum, I'm going to be harder to push around. I'm six one now. I'm more athletic. Were you ever in sports or were you doing anything that might have been building confidence? I mean, maybe not through the junior stage, but did you get into anything like that? Like, what are the things that besides just your physicality that started to help you 
kind of transform? Yeah, so it was, um, you know, I, I grew up next door to a guy named Bruce Miller who uh, was on a softball team. He actually played in the Pan Am games. I think they won a silver medal back in the 80s. A very athletic guy. Never cut me a break on my fatness. But he did it because he cared. Like, here's a guy who genuinely cared about my physical fitness. And so um, I started, you know, lifting weights. I started doing some exercising. And then uh, as we spoke before in your gym, uh, down the street was Bob Every, who is an amazing guy, uh, a boxing coach. He coaches uh, women's softball. I mean, he's just really well known in the Lansing area, and he took an interest as well. And uh, you know, I don't—he probably doesn't even know this, but some of the things he said to me and some of the things he taught me uh, went on with me. I, you know, I got in a boxing ring and really learned uh, that this is a very physical sport. Like this, it looks pretty easy on TV, but this is really physical. Anyway, I learned a ton from from both of them, and I think that really helped. And then when I got to high school, I, I joined the swim team. Right, I started swimming, and uh, it was just a, the whole thing was a game changer because uh, people looked at me differently, people treated me differently. The hard part in all of that was it was still me right inside, and it doesn't matter what you look like on the outside. When you grow up the fat kid, you're still the fat kid in your head. Um, but uh, it was really helpful uh, to get into organized sports, to make friendships, to have a coach. Uh, to know that there are people out there who are interested in you, not because they can get something from you or they can use you for some purpose, but you, just because you're, you're who you are. And I learned that from sports, from high school sports. The words you just said are so vital because you've experienced the opposite side of the spectrum. You experienced what people will do that don't have character, that are willing to take advantage of people, put their own you know interests above another human being that deserves the same grace that they deserve. And then you got to see the other end of the spectrum. And it's like, this person is selflessly giving to my greatness, wanting me to excel for me, not because of a return on investment they're going to get, because that's what a coach should do. And not even just a coach, good people in life should want to see other people build, you know, and, Bitter people tend to like, if well, if you build, then I don't feel as good about myself, so I can't let you build. That's garbage. That We need to work on throwing that idea out. So that's profound. Uh, already your story has so much depth to how you've been stretched as a person. You've got to see great things in life. You've got to see darknesses in life. You've got to see structure in a family. You've got to see broken family. You've got to see law and order in your house with like, Hey, here's your routines to feral, as you said, where it's like, you guys are kind of fending for yourselves. And like, you know, um, one thing I've learned, I mean, I'm not a parent of my own child, but my fiance son is kids thrive with discipline. Kids thrive. Her son is a dramatically better young man, the harder I am on him. And I try to be as good to him as possible. Let him know I love him. I'm there for him. I want to be his friend, his mentor. I want to see him win to the biggest level in life. But like he does better the harder I push him. And that's like a really weird thing because you want to be like, you just want to make people feel good and be soft on them. And But you, you actually cripple them if you if you do that. So you start to experience the opposite end of your spectrum, which doesn't change the internal quickly, but it might change the external enough that you fumble yourself into situations that, you know, maybe you can handle, maybe you can't. As you're going through high school, what do you start to picture as like, what is Bill going to do? Who is he going to be? Where are you going to go? You're on the swim team. You're getting yourself together. You're starting to feel a little bit of what it feels like to be a worthy man. What do you think is going to be the next chapter in life? That's a great question. And, uh, you know, a lot of our family friends were actually police officers, great police officers from Lansing, East Lansing, kind of all over. And I really looked up to them. And while I was on the swim team in high school, I also joined the Explorer group who worked with the Lansing Police Department. And I learned a lot about law enforcement. I thought that is what Bill Krieger is going to do. I'm going to be a police officer when I get out of high school. Like, that was my traje trajectory. That was my path. You know, my friends all knew it. It was something I really, really had a passion for. And why did you want to be a police officer? 
lots of reasons. When you're a kid, one, you get to wear a uniform. Well, the uniforms are cool, right? You get to you get to you strap on a gun. But early on, I learned the importance of respecting a gun or a firearm. Right? It wasn't you strap this thing on and it's the wild west. That's not how it works. The other part of it too, in this, I learned this from the Lansing Police Department, is when you go out on a call, you're seeing almost all the time people on their worst day. And it's up to you as an officer to get them through that worst day. And that worst day could be they're going to jail for something that they did, or that worst day could be something has happened to them and you're there to comfort them. But in either case, it's about respecting people and helping them through whatever that hard time is. And I saw some of the best law enforcement officers on the planet do that every single day. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I love it. I mean, I remember being a young kid and looking up to police because I thought I believed in the ideals of justice and doing the right thing and criminals should be punished for criminal behavior because then you protect the innocent, you serve the community, you take care of the, every civilized society has to protect its vulnerable members. The way you do that is you hold evil people to the consequences of their actions. And at the end of the day, if you're the criminal or if you're the one that's at a point of life and maybe out of desperation, I don't – whatever drove you to do the actions where you're going to have an interaction with a law enforcement officer, at the end of the day, those consequences can actually help you get back on track. The same way that like Braden does not want me to come down on him when he makes a mistake, but it's the best thing that I could do for him. The worst thing that I could do for him is allow him to get away with a character thing that is out of character, that if he continues to be that type of man for his life, it will lead to him down a road to destruction. What I need to do is bring consequence, not because I want to punish you, but because I want you to live a better life. And at the end of the day, like I remember having that belief. And if more, let me tell you what, being a police officer in today's culture is unbelievably difficult. Because nobody gives you the compassion of how steadfast of an absolute warrior you would have to be to interact with these people that are at a, like you said, let's say they're having the worst day of their life. You are coming in as the judgment, as the consequences, as the, you know, everything they don't want, the accountability. And guess what? They don't see it as their fault. They see it as your fault. You know what I'm saying? And it's like, this is where the delusion comes into play. So I asked you the question of why, because I believe that there's an honorable pursuit of that because you have people that'll, you know, they, oh, you just wanted to be an officer so you could abuse your authority. And it's like, do you think that that's the norm ever? That's probably 5% of officers, 10% of officers. And maybe if we gave them more love, compassion, grace in how difficult it is to be a good man in that profession, maybe they would work harder to do so because they would actually feel appreciated and, 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 and grateful. So you get through high school, you start thinking, I'm going to be an officer. You do, you do the training that we have. Actually, one of my fighters is doing the exact same program here through Livingston County. You do that. Do you go right into the police academy? Did life have other plans for you? Let's start to unveil that. Well, you know, the, the uh, best laid plans of mice and men, right? Not, nothing, things rarely turn out the way you think they're going to. They always turn out the way they're supposed to, but rarely how you think they're going to. And so uh, towards uh, the end of my high school career, uh, I met the love of my life, I thought, uh, the one that would, you know, I was going to be with forever and uh, actually worked for her father. Uh, he owned a lumber company in Lansing. I won't name names. Uh, but man, I thought this was it. Like nothing else mattered. And she went out east to school uh, because her family could afford that. And I stayed in Lansing and I worked at the lumber company and just kind of kicked around and never really got to the point where I was pursuing that dream or that goal. I uh, went to college for about five minutes and that didn't, that didn't really work out for me. I was not, I was not a college person. And uh, then she sent me the, the, the dear John letter, right? You know, the old, Oh, I think we should see other people. And you know, I'm, I'm here at college. Yeah. It was terrible. It was terrible. So I went down to the uh, – Hold on. Let's, let, we, let's not skip over that okay. because it sounds like you really had your first love. And as a kid that has gone through what, you, what I already know that you've gone through in your story, without you elaborating, I understand the pain, darkness. 
you found someone that you loved and you found someone that you thought deeply loved you and you created a story in your mind of we're going to sail off into the sunset, baby. Like it's us against the world. This is going to be beautiful. Like I can just be Bill Krieger at this lumber yard. And when you come home, like life's going to be great for us. And when people attach to stories, we were talking a little bit about this before the podcast. Right. You don't want that. You don't want to let go of that story. No matter what, like you've already aligned yourself into that. You can see the movie in your head. You know, she's by your side walking down the aisle is, you know what I mean? Like, you know that. When you get a spear through the heart like that, that is a huge moment of development for people. That shakes your snow globe. That snaps you out of your dream state. That's Bill Krieger, the lumberyard man, is no longer sufficient to keep the woman that you thought was going to love you forever. How did you get through that, man? Like, How did you go through that period? In what ways did it change you? Did the trajectory of your life change, et cetera? Talk a little bit more about that, and then we'll keep going. Yeah, so I, um, it was tough. I'm glad I had good friends around me uh, because they kept me busy. Uh, these were the same friends that uh, accused me of ignoring them after I met this girl, right? Because I remember they had written in shoe polish, you know, don't forget your friends on the side of my car one night. I mean, they were pretty upset that uh, I had dumped my friends for this girl. And, uh, you know, let me just say, thank God it didn't work out. No, for sure. Right? I, I, when I was asking <laughs> but, you this uh, question, I actually thought in, in my on the backside of my mind, like, I hope that like his wife or anything wouldn't take offense to this today because this is before all those peers, but you got to take yourself back to that moment in life, to the Bill Krieger that sat there then at that moment that didn't know that his future is way more beautiful, better person, better existence, better family, all those things objectively is true. That doesn't mean that in that time of your life that your experience was invalid because if you've only been stretched to that level, when you go through that experience, it is earth shattering. You don't know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel that's a more beautiful pasture than you've ever seen in your life. The magic in these stories is the the realness and the vulnerability of being able to be back in that point and say the truth and then preface it or, 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 or you know the asterisk of thank god it didn't work. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I I don't know how else to say it except I was I was crushed. Like, I didn't want to go to work. I didn't want to get up in the morning. I, you know, like my whole world came crashing down because, you know, like you said, I had envisioned what my life was going to be like with this person. And uh, it clearly did not work out. And, uh, you know, I didn't know what else to do. I couldn't go to college. Clearly working for a lumber company for minimum wage was not going to be what I needed for my life. And, uh, you know, I had a great time with my friends. You could co even call it a gap year, right? Right after, right after high school, just kind of did nothing. And then uh, I just, I knew that I needed to do something. And I didn't know what something was, right? A, a lot of times we know, hey, I've got to get to X. How I'm going to get to X or what X looks like, I'm not really sure, but I need to do something. And I, that's when I just stumbled into the recruiting office. Uh, the Navy recruiting office of all things. Now, my my stepfather, uh, there's no such thing as a former Marine. My stepfather was a Marine. I grew up in a house with him where this is where we actually had some structure uh, was when he came into the picture. And how old were you? Uh, so I must have been 14, 13 or 14 when he, when he came into the picture. Were you rebellious initially? Did you accept him in? All of a sudden, this strange man who's a Marine who is not your father comes into the household and starts, you know, trying to set rules and standards. Tell you what, testosterone starts flowing as a young boy, and you're like, I don't know if I have to listen to you. What, what was that period of your life like? Yeah, I was terrible to him. I was awful to him uh, because, I, you know, I had a dad. Uh, who was not active uh, at all. Um, and here you're right. Here's this guy who has all these crazy rules. Like, I learned how to make hospital corners on my bed. If you're listening or watching this podcast, you know what hospital corners are? Look it up and then go make them on your bed because that was the requirement. I remember, so he served in the Marine Corps in Korea and he was in supply. And so I remember like stepping out of the shower, out of the bathroom after shower and, uh, the, you know, there'd be steam in there. And, and his philosophy was if the, if the mirror is fogged up, 
then you've either taken a shower that's way too long or way too hot or both, right? You don't do that. And oh, by the way, you can only use four squares of toilet paper a day. And here's how you do that. Like these were the rules. Like we went from like this white picket fence family to feral children back to this guy who used to, you know, used to be in the Marine Corps. And I think maybe to some extent thought he was like many Marines do, right? They get out, they don't ever leave the Corps. He used to go celebrate the Marine Corps' birthday with all his buddies. And so that's what it was like. But I, I don't think I hated him for that. I think I hated him because I couldn't hate my own father. Wow. The fact that you can look back and be able to say that with that type of clarity now tells me you've done unreal self-reflection and you've really healed so much damage that's happened in your psychology. Like the fact that you could just say that out loud is, I mean, cause that is probably what it is. A man that doesn't belong in your house in your eyes as a child, your father's supposed to be in that role. How dare you tell me what I should or shouldn't do? Who are you? You know what I mean? But it's like all of a sudden when you look back, he probably helped you in a lot of ways by forcing you to be something that you weren't at the time. Would you, would you say that's true? He, he was a brilliant man. Uh, he was an accountant. And so from him, I learned about finances from him. I learned how to balance a checkbook. I learned how to drive. I learned, I mean, I could just go on and on the things I learned from this, this guy that I just absolutely hated when he, when he first showed up in my life. That's huge, man. I mean, that's, and then it redefines everything for you because your emotions had told you like, I hate this guy and everything. And then over time, you had lightly talked about it before where these people that were giving to me that like didn't even have to, like, what's his motive? It, why is he trying to make me better? Why is he trying to help me? You actually find that like, God damn, that's what love is. Love doesn't have to be parental. It doesn't have to be from a family member. Love is when you genuinely give to someone else to try to enhance the quality of their life without being like, I'm doing this because you owe me blah. And it's like that man was to the best of his capability being a good leader to you. You know what I mean? And like, cause he could have come in and been an absolute tyrant, been horrific to you and, and not tried to teach you a single skill or anything, but like although his processes might not have been great and you probably hated it as a child, it was good for you. And then was it not until way later on that you started to recognize that or after years and years that are ticking by, did you start to recognize that this man isn't that bad or did you the whole time you're in the household despise him? Let's finish with that and then we'll start to continue the story. Yeah. So there was a point in time, I think, uh, after high school, you know, before I really entered the military where uh, I came to appreciate him as a father figure, you know, not to, not to uh, say that I don't still love my own father. I mean, my father's still alive and I love the guy, uh, but this guy was doing the things that a father does. And even at that age, you know, I, really needed that discipline in my life, whether I appreciated it at the time or not. But I think I really did start to appreciate it pretty early on because when, when your life is total chaos and then order comes back to it, like you notice, like you notice the difference. And honestly, the battle between like good and evil is also a better battle between order and chaos. And it's like, so when you're in a really tough space, depressed, and you can't do much, if you can just start to re take control of your life, bring some order back, some routine back, some accountability to anything that you hold as valuable, it starts to heal you in ways that you may not recognize on the surface, but it like gets into who you are. You may have gone into that recruiting office in a large part because of that man. Had he never come into the picture, there's a good chance Bill Krieger does not walk into that Navy office. Right. So let's start from that point. You go into the recruiter's office. You say, you know, I'm considering enlisting. How quickly does that come together? What branch do you sign up for? What is your military experience life? And then that's now all of a sudden, to be honest, you actually had a little taste of it because you've already been living under this rule set. It's not that foreign. If you would have went from that feral child into a military structure, you'd have been absolutely bewildered and crushed. You almost got a taste of it and said, maybe this isn't as bad as I thought. 
So start to unveil that process. You know, a lot of the lessons he taught me got me through basic training. I, you know, I knew how to make my bed, all of those things. But, you know, I walked into the recruiting office. I didn't think about the Marine Corps because, quite frankly, that whole thing scared the crap out of me. I watched all the movies, right? Full Metal Jacket. I'm like, I'm not going to be a Marine. This is just not going to happen because I'm going to be, I'll be Private Pile. That'll be me, right? They'll, he'll be kicking me off his obstacle course. So uh, that's not going to work for me. Um, I didn't even consider the Air Force. That didn't seem like the military. Um, no offense to anyone has been in the Air Force, but it just didn't seem like it to me. The Army wasn't a consideration, so it was the Navy. So and you were a swimmer. I mean, a swimmer and Navy kind of correlates. You would think, yeah. So, so it all kind of came together. I walk in, and I'm ready to join. You know, so like this is going to be the easiest thing this recruiter's ever done in his life is recruit Bill Krieger. And so I took the, the ASVAB test. I did really well on it. They're like, well, you just kind of pick what you want. Uh, I went to uh, Detroit Maps. This is when, when, when the processing site was in Detroit, not in Troy. And I stayed at the, the, uh, the Mariner's Inn. I'll never forget this place. And it's actually a rehab clinic now from what I understand. But the Mariner's Inn was this awful hotel. And I stayed there the night, uh, went in, got my physical, swore in, uh, chose to go into uh, guided missile computer systems. And that was, I was on my way. I uh, enlisted in July of 80, 84 and left the day after Christmas in 84. Now, between the time I enlisted and the time I left, I actually managed to find another girlfriend. Uh, so things had really changed for me by the time I got on that bus. And, and I remember getting on the bus because th there was an ice storm that day. And it took hours to get from, from Lansing to Detroit. And then our, our flights were delayed and all that. But I just remember leaving right after Christmas in an ice storm. It's like you, you couldn't write this into a movie. This is brutal. You're looking at everything going, oh, my gosh, is this the right choice? I just met this new girl. I know what distance does to relationships. You were a man that just experienced that. Now you're the one that's going away. Um, let's talk about it like this with the military experience. Were the expectations valid that you had going in? What were the things that you kind of pulled during the initial phase of your military service? And then what were the moments where to this day you think were the most impactful, influential times of your military service that still live with you? I mean, I'm sure all of it does. But for sure, there's probably some moments or some experiences that stood out. And then we'll have to talk about the chapter of transition out because that's always the most brutal for so many people. Well, and not to get ahead of ourselves, but I transitioned out and then I came back in. So there's there's more to that story, right? Uh, but, I, you know, I basic training, joining the military, that initial uh, schooling, that really lived up. To what I thought it was going to be like I wasn't surprised by anything I encountered in basic training I think the the one thing that I was surprised by were the number of people who just lost their freaking minds when they got there I remember so I went to San Diego and the Naval Training Center backed up to the Marine Corps Training Center and I remember this guy just lost his mind one night and went running out the back door of our barracks, hopped the fence thinking he was going to the airport and landed in Marine Corps basic training. And they kept him for a couple of days. They, uh, they trained him for sure. And he was very appreciative to be back. Is that like Camp Pendleton out there? Or what is that? Uh, must Lejeune be. or? It must be Pendleton. Yeah, I think it's Pendleton. Yeah. The Navy Training Center doesn't exist anymore. That's gone now. Uh, but yes. And so he jumped right into Marine Corps basic, which, I think taught him a few lessons, but I think the one thing that sticks out in my mind, even through that, not just through basic training, but through my uh, electronics training and my computer training, and then even going out to the fleet was that um, I don't think I'd ever really met people who um, just couldn't handle some of the pressures. What was it that you think the people couldn't handle and why was it that you think you were able to endure it so well? Do you think it was because of the trauma and the difficulties that you had been through and maybe the little taste of structure just being like, this ain't bad. This isn't difficult. Like if you think this is dark, hard times, consider yourself fortunate because this isn't that dark. What, what is it about the process that you think was breaking the people? Well, so I've got to be honest. In full transparency, like I'm scared crapless just like everybody else was, right? I, there's things going on. I don't understand them. But I, 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 
this is a tough one because I don't know if it's what happened to me when I was younger made me stronger or if it just allowed me to internalize it and not show that I was afraid of things and not say anything to anyone. Um, and so I think that had a lot to do with my success was my ability to not accept that this doesn't seem right or, or this is really scary, or I don't know if, you know, none of that even occurred to me to say anything. I just internalized it, sucked it up and drove on. And that made me successful. I don't think that made me a better person because it wasn't helping me mentally, but I was getting by. And so I didn't, I let those things bother me, but not to the extent that I was going to do something about it. Where I saw people go AWOL, I saw people walk away, I saw people get discharged, all those kinds of things. Um, you know, I think I might have felt the same way they did. I just handled it differently. And I don't think I was any stronger. I just think that I was better at, at hiding it. That's such incredible insight because you were very honest and clear about the fact that I'm not really sure what it is. Maybe it was just a coping mechanism that I had picked up from childhood. Maybe it had nothing to do with courage or anything like that. It could have been just the fact that I knew how to compartmentalize. Like, I'll deal with that later. We're going to throw that on the back shelf for now. That's really good insight. So as you go through your military training, you said you had actually gotten out and then went back in. Tell me about the story of how that happened. Yeah, so I, uh, I, I served 10 years active duty in the Navy as a computer technician, uh, served in the fleet, went overseas, did all the great things you can do in the Navy, had, had an amazing time. And after 10 years, uh, I just decided that it was time to try something else. I had actually been a recruiter for the last four years of my, my career in the Navy. It was, it was just time. So I, I said, I'm getting out. So I got out and I immediately went in to sell insurance. <laughs> So I'm going to uh, find meaning and purpose in selling insurance <laughs> yes. after being in the Navy for 10 yeah. years and being a part of a camaraderie and a brotherhood. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So you see how that worked out for me. I, I sold insurance for a very brief period of time. And then I went to work as a recruiter for a technical college, uh, which I won't name. And after a few months, got fired from there. So I kind of fit the mold of the, those people who get out of the military. And uh, I think it's 50% of them leave their first job within the first 12 months. And about 80% leave their first job within the first 24 months. So I was a statistic, clearly. Do you think it has to do with the lack of sense, a lack of purpose or lack of the fact that you were making enough of a significant impact to really matter and then that dr kind of drives you nuts? Do you think that was a factor? Yeah, the challenge in the civilian world is it's not the military. I, that's just the best way to put it. There's no clear guidance on how to get from this job to this job or from this point to this point. There's no structure really to speak of. And, and so I kind of just wandered around for a little while. Now, at this time, I was married. I had a mortgage. I had a child. I had cars. I mean, I had responsibilities. So you're living the normal American dream. It's just unfortunately, having been in the military for 10 years, you've seen that there's other ways of life and you don't want to accept what you're currently living is like, hey, is this how we ride off into the sunset? When you said I had gotten out of the military and then went back in, that sounded to me like it was like a quick, like you were in the military for a super short period. 10 years, you, your identity was Bill the naval whatever title that's who you were so when you step out of the military and you're just bill krieger the former military service member that's a huge change in a chapter you know what i mean a lot of times the military sells you a little bit of a delusion of the way that you're going to be respected and treated and everything when you get out and all the doors that are just going to ex you know shoot open for you and that tends to not be the reality I don't want to skip over that first 10 years. Were there any moments in that first 10 years that you would talk about on the podcast because they were incredible? They were they were light switch moments that changed who you are forever, times where you learned about real leadership, just anything in there. And if not, if there's like, hey, you know what? It was a pretty normal career. There was ups and downs, but nothing profound. Then let's definitely talk about you're having the civilian experience. You're not getting the the what you need out of it, the purpose, the camaraderie, et cetera. What drives you back in? How do you even have that conversation with your wife, et cetera? 
Yeah, there's a couple of things that I really remember about my time in the Navy. Uh, the first one is my very first supervisor, this guy named Scott Chisholm. And uh, he was just, he was a nut for lack of a better way to say it. Like this guy got stuff done. Like he was an awesome military guy. Like he knew how to be in the Navy, but he also knew how to have fun with it. And I got the, I got this great lesson from him. You know, one time we got my work center. There's like five of us. We got in trouble. We had, uh, we had fallen asleep during some drill or something like all of us. And we had really gotten in trouble. So our senior chief petty officer came down to chew us out. We knew we were in trouble. We knew we had screwed up. You know, we were, we owned it. You know, we were accountable to ourselves and to each other. And uh, the senior chief is standing in front of like four of us. And Scott, who's our supervisor, is standing like next to him, but slightly behind him. And the whole time the senior chief is just reaming us up and down, Scott's behind him making faces, right? So because Scott knew, like he knew that we felt bad about what we had done and that we were not going to do it again. He wasn't going to, he wasn't going to usurp the senior chief's power by saying anything, but he helped us get through that particular situation by doing what he did. I don't know that I would do that, but he taught me that you can have fun even when things are really dark for you, because that was a really seriously bad situation. Thankfully, it was just a training situation and we learned from it. Um, but that was the kind of things he would do. I, I could get into other things, but I don't think it's appropriate for a podcast. But uh, no, he was just that kind of a leader where you respected him and you got stuff done because you didn't want to disappoint him, right? So I, I learned that. The other thing I learned was when I went into recruiting, I, I uh, had just gotten to the recruiting station in, in uh, Mount Pleasant. We were right outside Central Michigan University. And recruiting is a very serious vocation, like we all took it very seriously. You have to recruit so many people a month and you have to do it the right way. And you have to follow all the regulations. You have to do all of these things exactly right. You have to be perfect uh, because if you're not perfect, you're not going to get what you need from this. And I remember like the first or second day I show up and I work with this guy named Alan Joseph, uh, Petty Officer Joseph. And we get in the car our government because they give you a credit card and a government car and you go talk to high school students. Like it's the greatest job on the planet, but it's very stressful. And we end up driving out in the middle of nowhere in uh, central Michigan, and we drive by this post office. It's the world's smallest post office. It's the size of a shed. And, and we kind of joke about it. We get out, we look at it, and he goes, the reason I took you out here is because this job is very hard, and there are going to be days where you're going to need to do this. You're going to need to get in your car and go in the middle of nowhere and just breathe. He said, don't forget that. Don't forget you have a job to do and you have to make mission, but there's also going to be days where you need to take care of yourself. And this is one of the ways that I do it. And to me, that was a huge lesson that you can work really, really hard and you can do all the things you need to do. But if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be good at what you do. That's huge. And I feel like that's something that our society has definitely recognized now. And the pendulum might even be swinging too far where we're getting to the point where like, you know, everything is toxic. Everything is working too much. But for sure, I know that as an entrepreneur and as a business owner and fighter and listen, if you're going to go hard, you need to give your body physically and mentally, spiritually, whatever words you want to throw on there, recovery or you will hold. It's like RPMs on an engine. If you hold it to the floor, eventually the engine is just going to blow up and you're going to perform terribly in all your tasks. That's real leadership. He was trying to say that like, yeah, we want the gold standard. We want you to give your best, but that's not attainable and sustainable if you don't focus on these aspects too. People in positions of power or authority, having that type of transparency and authenticity to show you the real, like not just like I'm superhuman, I smashed this job, this is what you have to do, but showing you really what it takes and what the blueprint looks like. Those are the best leaders, man. Those are the people that really change people's lives because it's not just I'm awesome and you need to be this awesome. It's like, well, how are you awesome? How do you accomplish those things? So you didn't really find fulfillment in life outside of the military, when you walked away from this, you had had, you know, examples of leadership. You've had examples of, of conflict and difficulty and missions. Like you and I said, right before we started this podcast, they're like men. And when I say men, men and women are better with a mission in life. 
we are better with a conquest. We are better with a struggle. We are better with some type of opposition. And that opposition can be self-imposed. It can be your own inadequacies. That opposition can be your desire to sit on the couch and eat shitty food when you shouldn't do it. That can be, but men are better with a mission. And you don't have that in a lot of the civilian world. And you see a lot of empty people. You see people that are shells of what they could be because they don't take up a fight. They don't find something worthy of pursuing and their life turns into this wishy-washy floating through experience. But you got a family, you have a child, you have bills, you said I have a mortgage. Those things are usually the barrier that doesn't allow a man to go on a mission because you're like, I can't let any of this fail. So my responsibilities dictate that I do this. How did you decide to change that and go back to the military? What was the final straw? Was your wife supportive or not? And then the second time you go in, it's probably with a sense of gratitude. It's probably with a sense of invigoration, with a sense of like, okay, we're back, baby. Bill Krieger's back. Talk me through that period of your life. Yeah, there's a, there's actually a lot more between getting no, out please. of the Navy. Please, yeah, so, 100%. Keep yeah. going on that area. But then that's what we'll work up to. Yeah. Yeah, so I uh, I finally so I, I I get fired from my job, you know I'm collecting unemployment. I'm trying to figure things out. These this is not a good. I'm not in a good place. And a friend of mine calls and says, "Hey, Consumers Energy is hiring dispatchers," and I've got this background in electronics and electricity, right? I can read schematics, and that's what they were looking for. So I go and I interview for this job, and I get it. And so I go to work for Consumers Energy as a dispatcher in their electric lines department. And that brings back a little bit of this mission focus because the reason a lot of military, ex-military find themselves in the utility industry is you think the utility industry is as close as you're going to get to the military. It has structure. It has chain of command. It has mission focus. Um, it has all those things you're looking for as, as, a, as a military person. And so I really got in there and just immersed myself into this into this job, and uh, so much so that I, I wasn't home a lot, and I was working holidays and weekends, and but the money was really good. I for the first two years that I was there, I was making extremely gr good money. I was, but I was working the hours and. Uh, and, you know, uh, I'm going to be honest, I was doing some things I shouldn't be doing and found myself uh, in that divorce category. So uh, here I am. I get divorced. Hold on one second. Let's yeah. let's go a little deeper into that. Do you think that's because the damaged child that had grown up who had still hadn't really put yourself fully in order? Yeah, you had found some success in the military and like that. All of a sudden, for the first time in your life, you now have a lot of resource. You have money. You have position. You have all these things. So many times, if you have not healed on a on an internal level, you're like not ready for those moments. And I try to tell people that like Mike Tyson on a recent podcast said one of the scariest things I've ever heard, but it's so important that I try to tell my fighters now is like when you start breaking through at life and he's very spiritual now, he's like, you'll be highly favored by God, but you'll also be highly favored by the devil. And what I mean by that is he's like, when life starts giving you everything you want you start getting money you start getting attention you start getting recognition you have the ability to do the right thing or the wrong thing if you're not in the right place you're going to end up on the wrong side and you alluded to that but do you think that was a manifestation of those things like all of a sudden all the the paths that you never really could have walked down you were the abused kid you were the fat kid that had to create humor you were all these things now bill krieger's not that guy you're the 10-year military veteran with this that and the other thing you're making good money you're back on emissions and all of a sudden temptation comes in the door and says hey bill this might be the road you want to walk down you know what i mean do you believe that was a part of the problem because i think the bill that sits across from me today in the exact same position with the mentality and mindset you have now, with the wife you have now, with the, the love that you probably have for a significant other, you put yourself in the position, you go, no, I wouldn't make those decisions. But what, you know, just speak further on that before we jump past it. Yeah, I, I think you uh, you summed it up really well. Like I was, I was in this place that I'd never 
been before and uh, started thinking pretty highly of myself and, uh, yeah, made some very poor choices. I, you know, I'm not afraid to admit it. People know I, I cheated on my wife. Uh, I ended up leaving my wife and my, and my son. I ended up being the parents that I didn't want to have. Uh, to the point even where I, I didn't spend time with my son like I should have, I immediately got remarried, immediately started having another family, and really shut my son out of my life for a long time. And But it, but it was, it was a culmination of all of those things. When you're the abused short fat kid, right, and all of a sudden you're not anymore, um, I, I think you see it like on TV, right, these people that lose like, hundreds of pounds. And then all of a sudden they're not, their, their partner's not good enough for them. Um, you know, the, the Chevy citation that you drove wasn't good enough. You've got to have a Camaro. You need to have a motorcycle. Um, you need to have a boat. You need to have a bigger house. You need to, and on and on and on and on. You're just not ready for what life has brought you. And what a great way to, to put it. Um, you know, there's, there's good and there's bad and it's your choice. And at this time I chose to do pretty much all of the wrong things that you can do. And, um, you know, I, I paid for that, uh, in, in some areas, but so I, you know, I end up working at consumers energy. I've got this great job. I end up going through this horrible divorce. It was awful. End up not being who I really want to be. And, uh, and I'm, and I'm married to this person who I thought I had a relationship with, but really I'm not sure that I did. And, uh, things started to kind of come undone a little bit. And I left the dispatch. I stayed at consumers, left dispatch and went into, uh, engineering and design work. Um, and just wasn't, again, wasn't getting what I thought I needed out of it. And that's when I looked at the Michigan national guard, uh, because something we didn't talk about is during my time, in the Navy, uh, in recruiting, I also worked as a reserve police officer for the city of St. Louis. So I was getting that, that thing that I needed from being a police officer. I was in the military. Everything was great. Um, continued that, uh, when I went to consumers energy and then, and then kind of, you know, left the, the police work behind and really missed all of that. Uh, and so I found that in the Michigan national guard, I went to the recruiting office again, recruiter's dream. I just want to join. I want to be military police. Uh, they let me keep all my rank. And so I go into the Michigan National Guard. Now I will say, uh, my wife at the time was very supportive of that. Like she thought this was a really good idea. She could see that I needed something. And, uh, so actually on, uh, on Valentine's day in 1999, I joined the Michigan National Guard. I raised my right hand and, uh, that was the start of a whole different journey, uh, even though I'm still doing my thing at Consumers Energy, now I have this military part of my life back, and it feels good. Man, it's like when you hear stories like this, this is the beauty of life. This is the, you know, like as a child, you saw the damage that can be done from a family getting shattered apart, but life just takes you on these journeys, and if you're not so wide awake behind the wheel and like with a clear lens and knowing exactly what you should be, what you value, right versus wrong. It's like you can end up in the exact situations that you would probably logically would have wanted to avoid at all costs. And life will say, okay, if your character development isn't right, we're going to take you back through these hells until you figure this thing out. You know what I mean? And it's like that, it's, it's almost so beautiful by design. Even the pain is beautiful because you could not be the man you are today had you not put yourself back into those experiences. Maybe that young kid that never got the love and acceptance and validation from community around you and the respect that you deserve as a human being, that all of a sudden that you're finding through policing, through military, through a high paying job, all this, it's like, well, now you're not in the psychology to handle those things because they come with extreme responsibility. The higher value man you are, the more temptation is going to come into your life. So the universe is almost like, all right, you can have those things. Let's see how you handle it. 
And it's like, if you're not ready for it, it'll kick everything out from under you and you have to rebuild from the ground up. Not from zero, but from a new state of, oh shit, I need to watch myself. I need to realize right from wrong. So the National Guard makes sense to me. Hearing what you were going through, it makes sense while you're like, okay, I got to get back into something like this. When, when you went back in, is that a reserve program? Is that a full immersion program? Because you're working at, 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 at the, the consumer's energy. How were they okay with you transitioning back in? Or were you stepping away now to go National Guard? Just help me understand that a little bit more. And then did it give you what you were searching for? So when you go when you go to the National Guard, having come out of the military, uh, I had to go to a reclassification school, which was two weeks to be military police. So it was really the you know one week in a month, two weeks in the summer. Consumers Energy, just let me say this: they are amazing for their veterans, and we'll talk about that as we talk about my career there. But they took care of me and my family the whole time I was in the National Guard. Um, but yes, my full-time job was working for them. And then I would do my, you know, two, two weeks and one, one week in a month and so on, um, as part of that. And I was finding what I needed from that. Uh, you know, I learned a lot of things. I learned that I was getting tired of being the victim of other people's strategies, right? So as an enlisted person, I really was just kind of at the mercy of my leadership. Now I could give pushback, but I was not the decision maker. And so at the age of 38, I decided to go to officer candidate school. One of the oldest people in my class, actually to get a waiver to become an officer. Also didn't have a college degree. So while I was working at Consumers Energy and while I was going through OCS, I was also going full time to uh, first Lansing Community College and then Central Michigan. Because when I finished OCS, I had to have a bachelor's degree in order to get my commission. And so I found what I was looking for. I found a lot of hard work. I found a lot of challenges. Um, you know, I found that I had to prioritize and balance. And you have a relationship on the side of this while you're going through all this? Are you still with that woman that you had found, or well, you had no. stepped away from her too? I, 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 no, no. So I'm married now to my second wife. Yes, yes, yeah. I got that. And but I, I have small children. And you're, and you're, so you juggling that at the same time. Yes, but I did. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no girlfriend uh, in that picture, right? No, 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 yeah, no, no, no. Let's just be clear on that. No, I just meant woman by your side. Sorry, I should yes, have been yes. very, very. Clear I thought about you said that. on the side. <laughs> no, no, no. I just mean on the side of the fact yes. that you are immersing yourself in all of these endeavors that would, I mean, one of them is substantial to be as doing as many things as you were. And in a weird way, I hate to say this, but a lot of times people that have gone through a lot of like darkness or you do immerse yourself into things fully because it helps you run from the quiet conversation that you might have to have when you look at yourself at the mirror one day and say, Oh shit, am I to blame for something like that? A lot of times people, when they go through hell, they just dump themselves into a work or a pursuit or a passion because the demons are right behind you and you don't want to turn around and look at them, right? So you're, you're going through this period. Let's just elaborate on this more. And then does it start to give you the mental state you need? The second wife now, is that the woman you're with today? No, no, she is not. So you're going through this period of your life now you're immersed in trying to be on a new quest. What are the ups? What are the downs? So I, I do want to say that my wife at the time was very supportive. Like she really supported me going through OCS. She really supported me getting my degree. I think that she was going to college at the same time as well. So it was very busy in, in our house. Um, but I always had time. I can't say this. I always had time for my two children that I lived with. I never had time for my son who didn't live with me. And a lot of that had to do, I'm sorry, hold on. No problem. I thought I had this shut off. No problem. It's off now. You said you never really had the time for your first son, which is like, I can tell you hold a ton of regret for that. And it's like, you're at a point in your life now where you can look back through all the storms and the chaos. And the man that sits here today, 
unfortunately, Bill, you just had to go through what you did to get to the man that you are today. And it's like, yeah, we would all change our timelines if we could, but you had to experience that much darkness to heal from the darkness of childhood and the lacking things and the broken family and the way you were treated by kids in school. You had to go through that to actually come out to where you are now. So it's amazing that you can speak so clearly because a sign of someone that's not very healed is when they can't say things as clearly and concisely as you are right now. And I, yeah, and I, I do hold a lot of regret for the time that I lost with my son. Now, I could say things like, well, my wife didn't want me to, and she she really fought any time that he was going to come over or any time I was going to spend time with him. But at the end of the day, he is my son, I am his father, and I should have done the right thing and I did not. And so I've always felt I've always felt guilt about I've always felt bad about that because I think he he deserved um so much more uh than what he got. You almost didn't have what you needed to give, what was necessary to put your foot down to someone that loved you at the time. You don't want another failing relationship and say, "Listen, this is a non-negotiable. My son will be in my life." That doesn't mean that I don't love you and it doesn't mean I won't be a good father to these kids that are in my life, but my son being in my life is a non-negotiable. The type of character it takes as a man who had his woman write him the Dear John letter when she left, as a kid that went through the things that you did, to even expect you to have that type of character, to be able to put your foot down and say, despite me loving you and having married you, this is a non-negotiable. You will respect me on this. It's, it's a fantasy world. It's it, no one in go, having gone through what you went through. They wouldn't have the strength of character in that time to be able to do that. Or it's the superhuman version of us that we all aspire to be, but is very hard to reach. But looking back, it's like, it didn't even work out anyway. I should have put my foot down all along because I damn well knew what was right. Those are the most valuable lessons in life. Because when we reflect back, we go, now I know the answer and I will die on that hill. You know what I mean? I will stand in opposition to something that I know is wrong because I see the results of not standing on it, the regret, the pain, knowing that I should have been a man that I wasn't at the time. I, I won't sacrifice that for anything, you know? And, and that's how you feel now. I can see it in your eyes. When you say, I regret those times, you knew what you had to do, but it's just so hard in the moment to do it because you think it's going to lead to the destruction of all the things. So you've rebuilt this thing that you value and you think it's going to lead to the destruction of all this. And we take the path of least resistance so often. And, you know, there's something else, too, I want to be very clear about is that I, I think a lot of people would say like, oh, if I had that to do over again, I'd do it differently. I don't know if I would. Like, because of the path that I took, I have an incredible son. I have two incredible daughters. I have a wife that just, I don't even know how to describe her now. But if I hadn't lived through all of those things that I lived through, I wouldn't, I, like, everything that you do brings you to the point that you're at right now. And so if you remove even one piece of that, it changes the outcome. So, so there's a lot of regret but I don't know that there's a whole lot I would I would necessarily change because it had to it had to work out the way that it worked out. You know, it didn't work out with with my second wife um, for lots of reasons, and and I think the main one is we just weren't supposed to be together. We were supposed to be together at the time that we were. My daughters are supposed to be here. You know, my son is where he is supposed to be. All of those things are the way they're supposed to be. But man, it's really hard to get there and then to look back and go, wow, I was not a good person when I did this, uh, but I can be a better person going forward. And I can certainly let my kids know what I think. And the one thing that I tell them is don't judge what you do by what I've done. Judge what you do by what I've learned from what I've done. Because my past is not a free pass for you to do all the stupid shit that I did. Well, and you can do it, but you'll go through all the pain, the depression, the darkness. Maybe you can't listen to my words and take the lessons that are necessary. Maybe someone could have came to you with a textbook that said, Bill, objectively, 
if you're in these situations, don't do this. Sometimes pain is the best teacher. Depression, heartache, going through those moments where you, you know, are suicidal ideations come into your mind. That teaches you the lessons you need to learn. And what you just spoke to is you could not be Bill Krieger that sits here today had you not learned those lessons for yourself. So parents always speak it to the fact that like, why don't my kids just take my advice? It's like objectively, if we just asked you a, you know, A, B question, should person A do these actions? You'd be like, no, but you had to go through those things to actually embody really what being a good person is, really what standing on the proper ground looks like, et cetera. So just continue. I, I've loved this dialogue so much today. Please just continue your story, story freely. Yeah. So we, so I may, I make it through OCS. I, I make it through school by some miracle of God and, and I get my commission, which was a pretty proud moment in my life. And, uh, you know, things are, things are going well. Um, you know, uh, work is humming along and the family's humming along. And, um, you know, we have our, we have our moments, uh, as a family. Uh, but then right after getting my commission, um, I got deployed to Hurricane Katrina. So I was gone for 45 days right off the bat, uh, went down there, provided security, did all the stuff that, uh, a uh, platoon leader is supposed to do came home as a, as a Lieutenant actually got command of a military police unit, which is unheard of. That's a captain role all day long. Uh, but somebody saw something and they liked it. So they, they said, Hey, we want you to take charge of the 144th military police company. Uh, so I take charge of the police, the military police company. And, uh, they start immediately taking all of my deployable soldiers right? Because the 46 MP company has to deploy and in the national guard, they will move people around. So they have a full deployable unit. Right. And I'll never forget, uh, in the middle of all this, like, I'm just trying to figure things out. I'm a brand new company commander. I come walking into my office and here's, here's Colonel stone, now general stone, now retired, sitting at my desk with his feet on my desk. And he, and he goes, Hey, I just want you to know, Lieutenant Krieger, that, Everything's fine. You're not going to deploy anytime soon. So you're going to have, you know, a couple of years to get your unit built back up. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And uh, two months later, I was sitting at the pool. <laughs> you know where this is going. I'm sitting at the pool uh, at my neighbor's house, enjoying life, and I get a phone call. Hey, Lieutenant Krieger, you got six weeks. You got six weeks and you're going. And I was like, what the hell? Right? And <laughs> it's so frustrating because the amount of people in the military that tell stories like that, the second you started to say that, I was like, that's probably bullshit. For as effective as the military is in so many ways, they just say shit that is not relevant at all. And you set expectations that should not be set at all. And you mislead people. And when you mislead people, they will resent you. You should objectively try to keep them as in touch with the real world as possible. If an emergency comes up or a situation changes, you're going to deploy, man. That's how it works. That's what you signed up for. You, what you said is like the most common thing. Hey, don't worry. You're all set. Just kidding. Deploy tomorrow. It's crazy. It, that's such a normal thing with veterans, man. And that like ripping people around like that and ripping their structure and stability when people attach to a story. Okay, I'm all set. I can focus on my wife and my kids. No problem. And then all of a sudden you call them and say, just kidding. That's way more devastating than telling them up front, hey, man, you might have to deploy. Oh, oh, it, it is. Believe me. And you know, we had to deploy with, uh, um, so what had happened was uh, the unit out of Connecticut that was supposed to take this deployment couldn't go, but they did have one full platoon. So here I am in Michigan, in, in, in Owasso, Michigan, I've got one platoon in Connecticut. I've got one platoon in Taylor, Michigan. I've got one platoon in Pontiac, Michigan. Um, I got one of my own platoons. And uh, so it's this hodgepodge of people who have never worked together. And I just remember the hours were crazy, just crazy, just getting ready to go to pre-deployment. And 
I remember working like 16, 18, 20 hours a day. Um, but one thing I really want to share this is, is one thing with my, with my daughters is that, uh, I always tuck them in at night before they go to bed. Like that's my job. That's nobody else's job. And so every day I would go to work and I would come home around nine or 10 o'clock at night and I would make sure that I tuck my kids in, read them a story, tuck them in, and then I would go back to work. Um, and this went on like for the whole train up. And, uh, finally it's like the night before, right? We're going to. The next day, we're going to go down to Battle Creek, we're going to get on buses, and then we're going to go to Fort Dix, New Jersey, which, by the way, Fort Dix lives up to what its name is. Um, anyway, but before we go, so I'm tucking my kids in at night, and I've got my oldest daughter, McKenna, and I've got my youngest daughter, Caroline. And my oldest daughter, McKenna, um, is just kind of, you know, she's just who she is. And so I tuck her in, you know, I talk with her a little bit, you know, we cry a little bit because dad's leaving, and, um, you know, she's fine. So I turn off the light and I go to my youngest daughter's room. Now my youngest daughter, um, is truly a smart ass. She has been since the day she was born and she's always saying things, you know, trying to be funny. I don't know if she gets that from me. Maybe, maybe not. Um, but like when I tuck her in at night, I'll go, Oh, Hey, I'll see you in the morning. And she'll do stuff like, Oh, not if I see you first or, you know, I'll tell her I love her and she goes, Oh, I love you more. And then I'll go, no, I love you more. And she'll go like, Oh, you're right. You do love me more. So that kind of, that's the kind of kid she is. And uh, the other thing is, is that every night when I tucked her in, um, I would close her, her, uh, her bedroom door. And uh, she would always tell me, close my door just a little bit, because she always wanted a little bit of light coming in. And uh, I would always, you know, yell at her. I'd go, oh, don't tell me how to close the door. You know, I know how to close the door. That was our thing. And so that went on. And so this night before I deploy, um, I do my routine, and I go into her room, my youngest daughter's room, and she's just not really saying anything. It's really kind of weird. And, uh, she's not doing any of her normal stuff. And I go to close her door and she doesn't say anything. I'm like, okay, now there's something wrong. And, uh, I go, Hey, what are you doing? And she goes, well, I'm staring at you. And I said, I know you're staring at me. It's kind of creeping me out. You know, I'm just trying to keep this light. I said, what, what's going on? And, uh, she's six years old and she looks up at me and she says, I want to burn you into my brain. So that if you don't come home, I won't forget what you look like. And I really had tried to protect these kids from that, but she got it. Like she knew what was going on. She knew where I was going and what it was going to, you know, potentially be like. And uh, that changed me in that moment that um, you just got to be upfront with kids about what's going on because they know anyway. You might as well be honest with them. And uh, we went to bed and uh, got up the next morning and went down to Battle Creek and got on the bus and headed to Fort Dix, New Jersey for, you know, our train up to, uh, to jump over to, uh, to Iraq. I mean, what a moment. It, it sounds like she is the more emotional one and the more like people like that, that are sarcastic, but she probably loves so dearly and deeply and is so attached and that night, that little child was experiencing emotional pain and fear. And what if I don't see my father anymore? And the older kid, the older siblings tend to be more self-dependent. I mean, they're the first child. They had to learn to cope by themselves. And they're more logically driven overall. You got that little girl that is just picturing what her life might be like if her father never came back. And it's like you bear that burden because that's what you signed up for. But to see your child bearing that burden had to be such a like unbelievable moment. Like I can tell to this day, you could probably vividly remember every second of that experience like it was 9-11. And here you are about to go to Iraq where people will lose their lives and some people will not go back home. There will be kids that will go to sleep one night and never see their father again. And like that is such a wild it's like you never want to think of it that way you think about the service you think about the brotherhood you think about the commitment the patriotism you might have you don't think about what about when caroline does never get to, never get to see her father again and you just witness the six-year-old articulate that message to you through her through her filter how you got on the bus to go to our afghanistan i mean it's what you have to do i suppose but like you're a better man than me i would just be like i'm not going I'm not, I'm not leaving my children. I'm sorry. Whatever disciplinary action I have to go through, I know I'm government property, whatever that it looks like. I'm not, 
risking not coming home for this child. You know what my dedication is to this kid, to ha- give her the life that she deserves, to give her the father she deserves, the leader she deserves. And you can't guarantee my safety over there. Nobody can. I'm about to go to a place where they've been fighting for thousands of years and they're going to keep fighting for thousands of years and they will take my life just because I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time or I catch an uh, you know explosive device that was meant for some evil man that I am not, I'm not doing it. Like I'm, I'm telling you right now, you're a better man than me in that way because I just would not do it. How you went that next day, and maybe that's that compartmentalization of like you just got to push it off into another chapter. I don't know what that must have been like. I don't know how you leave and you're not a broken version of yourself because you're at a higher level now. This is your, You've spent 10 years in the military. You chose to go back in. You've got a little bit of rank. You're the guy that's got to hold it all together. You've had ups in your life now. You've had downs. And now you're leaving again. And you've seen what leaving relationships is like and the heartache, the heartbreak. So let's shift to... Uh, you can talk about the time at Fort Dix if you want or just the moments that you remember from Iraq or the things that you think, you know, like shaped you, changed you, darknesses, whatever it is. And to be honest, Bill, uh, we're just now getting to that party story. We're at an hour and a half on the podcast. And like, bro, th- this conversation has been unbelievable. Like the dialogue we're having right now, I am so thankful for because I've witnessed so much beauty, pain up down, reflection, growth, suffering. I almost, I'm going to ask you this. I'm almost willing to, if you would like schedule and shoot a part two, where we kind of, we seal this part one. We have an hour and a half of footage for people to ingest that I think they're going to be blown away by some of the things you've spoken about today. I'd almost like to start fresh with a chapter two with like, you're now leaving your daughter going back off to deployment, you know, and shoot another two hours, man, because I have pulled so much from this conversation. And veterans, you see the veteran suicide rate? Have you seen divorce rate? Have you seen mental health issues in this country? It, it, it's alarming. And people seeing this journey and this story and the insights you're sharing, this could help a lot of people. So if you're up for it, I don't know how far you had to drive or how difficult it was for you to make this work. Maybe we wrap this up for today and we launch a part two in the next couple of weeks um, because, man, I want to be able to talk to you for another two hours. I have a I have a four o'clock commitment that I'll have to do. I'm going to leave that up to you. If not, we're going to have to summarize so much of the end of your story. And I have we haven't even got to where you are today. We haven't got through the the breakout moments. We haven't got to any of those things. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to come in. This is not a far drive for me. And uh, newsflash, as of Friday, I'm retired. So... Uh, so you got me, man. Incredible. This is what we're going to do then, Bill, because I have so many questions that when we talk about reflection, I'm going to, I have reflections. I want to go back through your story and pull input from, and I want to be able to speak to the young soldier or the, the child that's going through a, a father in the military, all of these things. What I'd like to do then is we will close chapter one here. And we're going to write chapter two. Let's say in the next two, three weeks, I'll give you some availability. We'll schedule like a two or three hour window together. And we'll just put your whole story together because man, you've really dropped. You know what I can tell is the amount of times you've come full circle in your life from hard times to a strong man to times get good to you become a weak man to you put yourself in hard times you have gone through that circle with like a goddamn wheel bearing you know what i mean and that is probably why i bet you now you live with gratitude with grace with love with appreciation for your life with the moments you spend with your children or your loved ones are probably so powerful to you now because you've gone through that cycle so many times you know and like To young people that are watching these podcasts, one of the things I can tell you, you need to beware about the good times in your life more than you need to beware about the bad times in your life. You understand that and I understand that, but it's like if you can take the message and the words for what I'm saying, you should be very watchful of yourself when things are going good because those are often the times where you will walk down the road to hell without even knowing it. 
So, Bill, I think this is a perfect way to wrap up session one. It's been an honor to sit with you today. I'm going to send you dates right away. I leave for Vegas with my UFC guy uh, shortly. He fights the former number eight ranked guy in the world in his next oh, fight. That's pretty awesome. It's going to be incredible. <laughs> I will get you dates. We, All right. we will film a chapter two. I appreciate so much what you've shared with me today. I appreciate the insight. I appreciate the knowledge. And, uh, you know, I just can't wait to have you back. So thank you very much, sir. Great to be here. Thank you for having me.